Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, Where's the Water, uh, a panel that uh, is sponsored by the VLS chapter of the Federal Society. And we also want to thank the Environmental Law Society for help with publicity for the event. Um, tonight's uh, panel and, and speaker um, are brought, uh, partially brought to you by the uh, Ewing uh, Kaufman Foundation for Entrepreneurship. Um, I want to just uh, quickly go over the format. The, the format tonight is slightly different than, than our typical format. Uh, first, um, Mr. Uh, James Workman will uh, speak. After that he speaks, we'll have about a 10-minute Q&A. Um, then um, Mr. Woodley will speak, and we'll have about a 10-minute Q&A. And then we'll convene, reconvene a panel uh, here to, to uh, discuss amongst the panelists and, and, uh, and, and have another opportunity for Q&A. So, um, bear, bear with us. If you have questions, there are index cards on your seat. Um, if you think of a question while the speakers are, are presenting, go ahead and, and write that question down, and um, someone will be around to pick them up. Also, also um, before you leave, there, there's a survey on your uh, seat from, from the Kauffman Foundation. It's just five quick questions that you can circle. We ask that you um, uh, take that survey and make sure to turn it in at the box uh, in the back before you leave. Uh, thanks for coming. I, I think uh, we should be in for a fantastic uh, discussion on water and its many implications. And uh, I want to uh, first introduce uh, the moderator for this evening and water uh, shaman. Uh, there was a little bit of a dis uh, discussion on exactly what a water shaman was, but I pointed out to uh, Richard, the president of the Federal Society, that unless you've been in one of John's classes, you've not seen his divination. So. Uh, for those of you who, have, who haven't had, uh, taken this class, maybe you should just to get that aspect. But anyway, uh, Professor Echevarria joined the VLS faculty in 2009. He previously served for 12 years as the executive director of Georgetown Environmental Law and Policy Institute at the Georgetown University Law Center. Prior to that, he was general counsel to the National Audubon Society and general... Just the moderators, you've been kind of... Explain <laughs> <laughs> it out. Okay, so, so, so uh, uh, he has uh, uh, three degrees from Yale, one from the School of Forestry from undergrad and, and the law school. And he's also, uh, probably most importantly, uh, a Kentucky colonel. So the uh, governor of Kentucky named him a Kentucky colonel, which he's very proud of. Anyway, so I'll get off here and let uh, John introduce uh, Mr. Workman. So uh, for 10 points, how do you think I, I came to be a Kentucky Colonel? <laughs> so our first speaker um, is Jamie uh, Workman, uh, who currently serves uh, as the Environmental Defense Fund's um, Deputy Director in charge of its Cat Share Design Center. Uh, he is also the co-founder of Smart Markets, a utility-based startup venture uh, which seeks to unlock uh, the scarcity value of water and energy. Um, he is a leader uh, in the design and creation of natural resource conservation markets uh, for freshwater and marine uh, fisheries. Uh, he's had an interesting uh, and diverse career. Uh, he uh, uh, worked as an investigative journalist uh, for a number of years. He worked uh, in the administration of Bruce Babbitt at the Department of Interior, uh, working on a variety of, of issues including um, national fire policy, river restoration, and endangered species. Uh, he worked with uh, Nelson Mandela on the World Commission uh, on Dams, um, and uh, he's now based in San Francisco, uh, working uh, in the uh, ever, ever uh, uh, fascinating world of water in California. And so without any, and I should also mention, last but not least, uh, he is the author of Heart of Dryness, how the last Bushman can help us endure the coming age of permanent drought. And I believe copies of the book are available and available for signature uh, in the back of the room uh, during the course of the proceedings. Yeah, I, I apologize for forgetting to mention this. So, so uh, there are 10 copies that will be raffled off. So once you turn in your, uh, your survey, write your name on the back of the survey, and then we'll, we'll pull 10 names out to get a free copy of the book. And, and Mr. Workman has graciously agreed to autograph uh, all the books. Great, thank you. And I just say you're going to do a PowerPoint, so yeah. we'll give you the stage, right. and then we'll, right. we'll have a little Q&A after that. Thank you. John, thank you. Uh, anybody have the book, uh, the first people here? Okay, so, so 
you're thinking about, oh, is this even worth getting a raffle for this? Uh, is it worth showing up? What's this story about? And it was a question that I, I got even before I started writing the book. What's this about? You know, time is money. We got exams. What's the book about? And I always answered depending on who was asking, of course. Um, uh, when I, I was in the uh, in the South, in um, uh, red state America, I'd say, well, it, it's a story um, about uh, a rugged band of individuals who come together and stand up to the big government and triumph in the end. And everyone was like, that's right, we're going to buy that book, that's fantastic. <laughs> and then I went down to Hollywood for a, a little bit of a, a, another meeting there, and I said, so what's the book about? I said, well, it's... Avatar meets the gods must be crazy, uh, meets an inconvenient truth, and like, oh, that's fantastic. We're going to have that book then. And my wife was like, okay, Jamie, this is three years of your life. What's the book about? I said, honey, it's about a wise matriarch whose family doesn't always appreciate what she gives them, but she leads them through a very difficult time. She's like, you write that book. And so I, now that I'm here, I, I can say uh, with this crowd, uh, it's a book about uh, water law regulation and entrepreneurship, uh, and, and it's uh, we'll, we'll get into how that is. This is the extent of my misspelling of Latin names, but a, a, a pun um, you can do Latin legal puns of uh, great. Uh, without water, nothing, and that's that's the essence of the book. This is what we're focusing on, and <clears throat> so many things. That water is embedded in everything, and. Yet, the two questions that run through every page of the book um, go right to the heart of things. Who owns water? Who owns water? How can you own water? What does it mean to own water? And who? You know, is everybody? Is one person? And related to that, if you can figure out that, then you can get at the other question, sort of an economic, what's it worth? What is water worth? We all think we know, yeah, I paid my water bills and so forth, but these, these are more than philosophical questions. They're more than academic questions. They're right at the core of any legal question having to do with the environment. And it goes way back. Can anybody here for 10 points and answer who this guy is? Not you, John. But John, if no one can, you're in trouble that you don't teach who this guy is. Anybody here of Aldo Leopold? Land, uh, Sand County Almanac, the land ethic, great guy. Um, you know, spent time in, in Wisconsin wrestling with these questions of, of nature. Wrote, you know, Sand County Almanac, and one of my favorite quotes in there said, there are two spiritual dangers of not owning a farm. One is the assumption that breakfast comes from the refrigerator, and the other, that heat comes from the furnace. What he was getting at is that if you don't own the trees, if you don't own the, the wildlife out there, you're not going to think about it. You're not going to be a good steward. You're not going to care and trace uh, and track the, the source of your sustenance. This leads us to the question of, if you don't own water, he didn't say leasing a farm, visiting a farm, knowing somebody who lives on a farm. It's owning a farm. I will return to that question of ownership again. <laughs> Anyone tell me who this guy is? All right, maybe... Wealth of Nation, Adam Smith, very good. Fantastic book, founder of all economic study, but he was perplexed, it was fatally flawed. Right at the center of it was this question he couldn't answer. He said, why is water, without which you can't have anything, is worth nothing, but diamonds are priceless? There's this paradox that, that he was unable to resolve. Um, you, know, nothing, you can do nothing with diamonds, and yet there, there, people will fight and go to war over them. Water, eh, not so much. That's one of the first paradoxes of, of, of water that uh, we're going to try to resolve today. The second, this is a much tougher one, uh, uh, William Stanley Jevons. It's like, oh, great, a, a history quiz here. He was uh, a, an economist in 1865 in England when they dominated the world through their industrial might and power and the, the Industrial Revolution based on coal. Coal was running out and everyone says, oh no, we're going to be in trouble. We're, gonna, we're running out of coal. It's sort of like today, peak, um, peak oil. What's going to become of us? And along came the, uh, the Silicon Valley people of their day. They said, don't worry, we've got really efficient at burning coal. We've got these steam engines, so problem solved. We're going to have all the coal we need. And he said, actually, you know what? It's actually worse than that. 
we're going to deplete coal even faster due to efficiency. And this became you know, one of his thesis statements, that a confusion of ideas that the economical or efficient use of, of any resource diminishes its consumption, that we, we conserve through efficiency. He says the very contrary is the truth. In other words, when you get a Prius, you say, gosh, I'm, I'm saving, saving, uh, saving fuel there. I'm, I'm using less fuel. And actually then people start driving it faster, like my parents, driving it further, um, driving it more frequently. Honey, you know, you know, I'll go down to the store and so forth. And they end up using the same, if not more, amount of, of fuel. You find this with these uh, compact fluorescent bulbs. You screw those in, and people leave them on longer. Um, and more importantly, you find it with water. The efficiency uh, devices installed in our homes and in our uh, universities end up making water cheaper and more of it to use, and we end up using more of it. Uh, in irrigation, we say, oh, we've got drip irrigation now. We're going to install that throughout the Middle East. And that ends up using more water, watering more places in the desert instead of restoring it back to the aquifers or to the, the poor. So, so this is the second paradox, that efficiency leads to waste. The third paragraph, and this guy is a really tricky one, and there's no reason you should know him, but you probably recognize his creation. Anyone know who this guy is? Anybody here play Monopoly when they were kids? Come on, be honest. How many of you still play Monopoly? Yeah, new hands come up. Uh, there's nothing quite like driving your friends and family into penury and submission and abject poverty. Uh, but Monopoly is an interesting thing. If you want to win, you go for this square. Um, that's, that's been proven. That's, that's the one. That and Boardwalk and Park Place. Uh, but the only real Monopoly that we're all wrestling with and that came out of that game is this one. Waterworks. And you can't put hotels on it. You can't put houses on it and so forth. It's a random assigned value. It's like, oh, yeah, it's a roll of the dice. That will determine what your waterworks are worth. That gets at the heart of this monopoly problem, the third paradox uh, of water. That water is a vertically integrated from the federal to the state to the regional to the local levels, um, you know, down to the water towers, down to the pipes in your home, down to the sprinkler systems out front, right down to the basic necessity. And this creates some problems. You can't have sort of two pipes go into the same dam. You can't have two dams on the same river in the same place and so forth. So it's a natural monopoly. That's just something we have to live with. Um, but it creates a problem. It was fine when there was abundant water for everybody and it was cheap and clean. <coughs> but climate change is throwing that out of whack. Uh, not just here in, in, in Vermont. Uh, I don't suppose that you know, the, the river outside is, 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 is going to dry up. Um, but uh, it's it's creating a pinch all around uh, the country and around the world. And so the only responses that most government have are, are regulatory responses, restrictions, rations. We're going to cut everybody 10%, and that punishes the people who've actually been conserving the most. They say, okay, we're going to slap some regulations. And, and this is really from Southern California. They say, you, you can't hose down sidewalks. Become unenforceable, or if, if they're enforceable, very arbitrary. And that creates new complications. The economists say, look, this is all very simple. All you have to do is jack up the prices, the, the rates you charge people for their water. Then you're going to have efficient use of water, problem solved. And interestingly enough, none of those economists who have the simple explanation never run for office. They're never employed uh, by the water uh, agency because this is political suicide. You can raise taxes maybe at a distance. Raising water rates unilaterally on across the board that gets you a first ticket uh, out the door. <clears throat> For this reason, as people start saying, hang on a sec, whose water is this? We decide how, that, how much that water is and what we pay for it. And water should be free anyways. Water is a gift from God. And so this provokes the natural reactions of like, how can you put a price on water? How can you charge us for this thing? And this is a problem around the world. From 53,000 utilities in America, uh, to 170 countries around the world, that water has no value in exchange due to these paradoxes. And when something has no value, you waste it. You use too much of it. And when you've depleted it from waste, it leads to conflict. And that conflict leads to extinction and leads to violence 
And this is something that's only getting worse uh, around the world. Um, spreading from you know, a, a handful of countries 20 years ago, uh, you know, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, to other countries uh, around the world. And so I set off on this journey and say, what are we gonna do about this? If America, if California can't figure this out uh, on our own, uh, somebody's got to. And it let me on the reverse the journey of, of, of human evolution uh, back to where humanity first evolved, uh, the oldest continuous civilization in the world. For the last 30,000 years, the Bushmen, the San, the Kwe uh, of the Kalahari. And you'll notice from this map, there's no rivers running through there. There's no standing water. Uh, the only groundwater that's really easily accessible uh, lies hundreds of feet below, uh, only to industrial drills. And so I, I was brought into this uh, in many ways by accident. Um, I, I read when I was in Southern Africa about how the government of Botswana, an otherwise fantastic country, but wanted to follow America and everything they did, said, okay, we would like to develop this wonderful expanse here for tourism, for cattle, for mining. And there's these indigenous people that are in the way, so we're going to put them on a reservation, just like in America. Uh, I don't know if that sounds familiar. And the only thing they didn't count on was that the Bushmen didn't want to go. And to say, okay, well, you have to go. We're going to, we've been delivering water to you for 10 years. Uh, we're cutting off that water. We're destroying the well. Now you have to leave. And a lot of them did. And a core group of Bushmen stuck around. They said, you know what? We've been here before. Botswana was a country. We've lived here before you started bringing us water. We can stay here just fine without you. And that threw out the, the government into, like, well, how would we do that? So they launched this siege around the Bushmen. And, and, and they were besieged. Not, no one could go in or out, except tourism could continue. So, enter Jamie Workman, uh, the, the, the Dudley do right. I honestly was feeling so self-righteous. I just met with some human rights people, and I said, we can't go through the same mistake here that we did in America. So I loaded up the, the back of a red Land Rover that I'd gotten about two weeks earlier with supplies and, and some food and some water. And I said, I am going into the Kalahari to rescue the Bushmen. And and it didn't actually turn out like I planned. Uh, uh, along the way, the, the, the air intake hose and the carburetor jiggled loose. I don't know when that happened, but it started sucking in dust, and I don't know how much dust it started, but I know exactly where that dust clog uh, shut off the engine because it couldn't breathe for any combustion. And so there I was in the middle of the Kalahari saying, wow, this, this is not good. Uh, and realizing how utterly stupid and how utterly arrogant I was saying, I have something to offer the Bushmen who've been living here for 30,000 years just fine without me. And of course, it, I turned around. I had sort of this conversion on the road, not to Damascus, but to, to vulture water, where they were believed to still be uh, hanging out. And I said, I've got nothing to offer them. I can't bring them. I can't help them. But maybe they can help me. Maybe they can tell me, if I can ever get to them, uh, how, how they've managed to live out here and thrive laugh and dance. So they look around the Kalahari, and I had a couple days to do so while stranded out there. It's a place where water resources, um, you know, are not that visible right off the bat, as you can tell from these. But to the Bushmen, it's a different story. We would see, ah, it's a beautiful baobab tree, uh, this huge pan, and they would see, ah, there's some water tucked in the branches there. There's some water tucked beneath that uh, rock there. And if you dig down from this plant here, you can find some more water. So they see things in a different way. You and I see an elip, the largest antelope on earth, uh, bigger than a lot of, uh, of cattle and able to jump you know, over, over these light fixtures. Um, they see a mobile drought-proof water container. These are where water resources for the Bushmen, where there's no other government, are earned. Remember that. They earn them through hunting, through gathering, through these sip wells that suck up the moisture and are able to store them in little containers, through the food that they gather and bring back to the camp, and owned. Water resources are owned because they're embedded in the food and the fuel that, that, are, that are produced in the Kalahari and that they bring back. And they're able to squeeze water out wherever they need it. Turns out where I'd broken down, there was lots of water around me. I just didn't know how to look for it or where to find it. And they're owned because they meet, even mark their uh, ostrich eggshell canteens. Um, that's this guy's property. And people know that it's his, and he's <laughs> hidden it somewhere and marked it, this is mine, for, for later. And plugged, a, plugged the, um, the hole in it to prevent evaporation. 
those tools evolve. They're not locked in amber. Um, the, the Bushmen, you know, when they find plastic containers, they make that a new canteen instead of a, a, an ostrich egg shell. When they find some old empty oil drums, they clean those out and make those. They capture the water as soon as it falls from rain and gather it up. And then they negotiate. Instead of just going back and having, oh, this is all my water. I've got my eland, I've got my, uh, my meat, I've got my salmon melons that I've gathered. They say, you know what? I've got more eland than I can use, and you've got some salmon melon. Let's, let's truck barter and exchange, if that sounds familiar. Um, where they, they start finding some interesting specialization. Some guy's really good at finding this kind of plant or digging up this water, and they're able to trade access constantly. And that trade brings them together. It unites them, it makes them cohesive. They start organizing their whole lifestyle and their whole economy around these water resources. And in the process, they turn what you and I would see in the middle of the desert from scarcity into abundance. And so I finished the book and I was just like, it's a great story, it's a wonderful, I think you'll enjoy it if you have time or this summer when you're done with exams. Uh, but it's sort of like, is this unique? Is this just the Bushmer extraordinary people? Um, and after I'd finished the book, I started looking around and finding, actually, no, they're not. Going back 3,000 years, uh, not a hunter-gatherer society, but uh, in Oman and in the Arabian Peninsula, the system of falaj or aflaj, had the same concepts of self-organizing around uh, water so that people could earn, own, barter, and exchange and negotiate the value of water among themselves. I say, okay, well, that's fine. Desert cultures are one thing, but what about Indonesia? What about Bali? And again, for a couple thousand years, these Balinese water temples uh, are organized around water. There's no central authority saying, you get this much, you don't get this much, or you have to use it for this, and you have to use it for that. There's no regulatory top-down restrictions there. They're constantly in dynamic exchange with one another. It's a way to, to water their crops for, for rice and to keep out the predators. The, the, um, the, the pests. So you go, okay, well that's fine, 2,000 years ago, but now actually in Spain, uh, getting more towards our time, the medieval Puerta system, same kind of system of saying, okay, our community draws on this river and we can use it by different, we can trade with one another, time, place, uh, function, and use. This was carried over to the New World in the Southwest, I know some of you guys are thinking of working in the West, Asequias. Um, where the, the Spanish culture carried this, this technology, and it wasn't a technology so much as a system uh, of exchange. And say, so, okay, well that's still 400 years ago, it's great if you had that tradition. A few years ago, when I was in Southern Africa, I found a similar kind of dynamic going on on an irrigation farm. And that's where, you know, the whiteies had all the, uh, all the rules, all the control, all the power, and a fifth generation Afrikaner farmer says, oh, I, I wanna capture some more of that, uh, but water coming off the mountains there before it's wasted in the sea. And after Mandela came into to office, said, sorry, you know, with all due respect, any new water is for the previously disadvantaged, the, the blacks and the coloreds. And so they thought and they negotiated and found that if 40 or 50 of, of his former landowners who called him boss said, well, we, we can get that water then, and, and the government said, yeah, you're entitled to that water. So they all collectively brought that water and their ownership, negotiated with the far farmer and turned their boss into a partner. And it's one of the most efficient water-using farms uh, that, that I've seen anywhere. People are staying afterwards to make sure that there's no leaks, that each drop uh, counts and has value. Again, a sense of ownership, organizing around the availability of water and giving it value through exchange, through <coughs> negotiations. So I call this system H2 ownership. Uh, equity shares of a local watershed to own, use, invest in, not necessarily money investing, but in your sweat equity, your time, your thought, and exchange. And they go, okay, great, nice stories, Jamie, nice book or whatever, but what does that have to do with law? What does that have to do with our regulatory structure? What does that have to do with a, a, a city uh, like South Royalton, uh, let alone New York City or San Francisco? You're not going to have these kind of quaint little exchanges. It's fine for a farm, maybe for hunter-gatherers or for tradition, but we're in a dynamic post-industrial society. And that's where it starts getting interesting. So what if, where the entrepreneurship came in, what if we could take the system 
that was perfected by the Bushmen for 30,000 years of R&D in the middle of the desert, and through which humans have evolved our, our, many of our, our characteristics and needs. What if we could combine that with something that you're all familiar with? An eBay, a Craigslist, some kind of e-trade, or some kind of electronic exchange system where you can connect the water use uh, in, a, in a utility, uh, monitoring that through data and so forth, and allow people to own something. And then organize around that and exchange it. Now, of course, this runs into a wall. It's like, well, you can't own water. There you can own use of water if you're a farmer and have done so for 150 years or so in the West. But no one in this room, unless you're a farmer from the West, which might be the case, can really own water. That water belongs to the state. So, well, let's keep exploring this. And what we ended up doing was creating this platform, AquaJust, uh, a save and trade platform that can you know, be scaled from 500 person utility to a 5 million uh, person utility. Um, and there's, again, there's 50, 60,000 of these utilities around, um, around the US. And our system then was like, what if you don't have to own the water? What if you can only own the credit that you earn by using less than your traditional amount of water? So if I've been using 200 gallons a day for the last three years, and I start getting down to 100 gallons a day, each day I'm earning this credit, this eco share of 100 gallons beneath my, my past threshold. That's like frequent flyer miles, people can relate to that, or credit card loyalty points. Um, that's something, okay, that's intangible, it, it lasts, it's, it's not moving the water or anything like that, you're not carrying buckets from one neighbor or neighborhood to another. Uh, it stays in there, and you can keep track of that. Say, okay, this is what you've earned this, this month. Uh, this, is, this is what you've earned year to date. It's a way of negotiating and organizing and thinking about the water you save in a different manner. 100 gallons, one eco share. That's just a unit of exchange. Well, who's gonna buy this? Now that I've saved you know, a bunch of eco shares, who's gonna buy this? And it turns out we've been asking around, there's a lot of people that would like to buy that. Your, your neighbors that are so wasteful and profligate, they can buy what you saved to offset their amount. Businesses, a, a, a Starbucks or some water intensive industry can say, yeah, we wanna go not just water neutral, we wanna go water negative. And, and so we'll buy up your eco share credits. A foundation, a, a nature conservancy or somebody can say, you know what, we'll buy up those eco shares to make sure they stay in the ground or in the water. Uh, utility can do so, uh, say it, itself, to say, okay, we're going into a drought situation we're gonna buy up eco shares to make sure that the demand goes down when we need it to. And we can then put a price on it. Everyone's free to negotiate this. No one is locked into this. No one has to do this. Um, and the city has then more flexibility to deal with development, new growth, uh, competing needs with uh, agriculture and industry and so forth. And we're gonna be piloting this in, in Sonoma, California, uh, which is wrestling with three endangered species on the Russian river as a way to say, okay, when those species are spawning, that value is going to go up even more. And we believe that this can help resolve those three paradoxes of water, where the value in exchange, what people trade that water for, or the water credit for, is equal to the value in use. We say that water is worth more for the fish or more for energy, um, and so we can, we can negotiate that. The efficiency gains are secured, not lost, so that if we all do use less, that water then stays in nature stays either in the ground, in aquifers, or back in the river. And it unlocks these natural monopolies that we've been living with for the last couple hundred years uh, with a click mark, um, where you're just you know, trading zeros and ones and so forth, where the water then has a new value that it didn't have before. And this is, this is Torek Luth Bukli, who's the, the protagonist of, of the story. Um, extraordinary woman, extraordinary woman, uh, who I told my wife, uh, you know, was modeled after her and so forth. Um, and this is their legacy. This is, this is when they triumphed, they stayed on, of what we can actually learn from them, from their system, from their way of life. Um, and she, but she said an interesting thing, you know, when I, uh, I was still, still in the Kalahari, she said, you know, um, when we were young, we lived well. We got our water from the roots of trees, from roots of plants, and, and, uh, and, and from animals. Um, but then, you know, actually she was about middle age when this started happening, 
people from the government started coming and they started giving us water and they made us dependent on that. And now that I look back, I think it was to make us obliged to them and depend so that we would have to move. But she didn't want to do that. She didn't move. She stayed and lived and died on her own terms uh, in this place that we would think of as a, host a hostile desert, which was the only world she knew and loved. And so this is, this is, I don't think anyone wants to be forced to move or adapt uh, due to what we see as water scarcity. And this is a new way of approaching water so that we can, we can live with abundance, and turn that scarcity into abundance. Thank you. Do you have questions? I don't think we need a moderator here. No, no, no. Uh, uh, Oh wait, or, or Tyler, you had some sort of deal where you wanted to collect the questions, or I'm I'm happy either way. Oh, um, okay, well, people can just post them. Uh, good, good. And I'll be disappointed if I haven't provoked some questions. Yeah. I was just curious, the sellers, the people to be earning the credits, would this just be domestic users, or would there be opportunity for agricultural or municipal? I'd say it's, I'd say it's a very good question. The municipal uh, agriculture is in a different system. They're, they're usually not within the same same utility, but commercial very much so. Uh, and in fact, we were worried in Sonoma, which is a big sort of winery area and, and a lot of restaurants and bed and breakfasts and so forth, and they want to have swimming pools and make people feel comfortable when they're up there. We're like, are these guys going to push back? Are they going to say, oh, wait a minute, we don't like the idea of water's value going up. we got a pretty good sweet deal going here as it is. We're using not just 100 or 200 gallons a day, we're using 15, 20,000 gallons a day. Uh, but they actually embrace this. They're like, this is fantastic, because now we won't be limited and feel guilty for doing this. We can actually uh, offset other people. And, come to think of it, we can start finding ways to reduce our own consumption, our own demand. Maybe putting that um, you know, low flush toilets, all the things that make sense uh, from an ethical point of view, but don't make sense economically. They can start covering their swimming pool. They can start, um, you know, planting a different kind of lawn out front. Uh, so they have an, an incentive both on the demand side and on the supply side uh, to, to think about water in a different way. Whereas before it was just like, no, I don't have time for this. You know, uh, I'm sorry we're running out of water. That is a political problem for me. Um, but uh, uh, Coca-Cola, Danone, some of the semiconductors, they face, like Torklut did, a question of like, okay, we're here in Salt Lake City. If water keeps getting depleted as it is, we're gonna have to move to, you know, Ohio or Florida or someplace that we think has more water until they run out of water and then move somewhere else. That's a huge operation. They don't want to do that. And this this enables them to sort of engage and find ways to, to stick around. Um, does the price of eco shares reflect scarcity? And if so, is there a concern that nonprofits and states won't be able to afford these shares in order to promote in stream flows? It's a good question because you often hear about the price of water. We need to price water right. It's used as a verb often. But, but for me, a price only emerges when there's sort of willing buyers and willing sellers. Um, a rate is one thing, a cost is another. Um, but, but saying we're going to put a price on water unilaterally uh, is the challenge. But um, what I'm hoping with this is that the price of water will be revealed for the first time uh, between the, the buyers and sellers. Um, right now we're not, we, in Sonoma people have said, so can a hedge fund guy come in and, and, and buy up these eco shares and so forth? They're like, no, if you're not living and working and operating within this watershed and hooked up to an account here, um, you, you can't participate in this market. So it's more like a farmer's market than sort of a you know, NASDAQ exchange. Um, uh, and it's you know, within the watershed. So within the Colorado River, you're talking like 32 million um, people, let alone how many business and different users there. The irony is that there's actually much more money uh, available, John, you can probably correct me on this, uh, for in-stream flows uh, to get that water back. But the farmers have been reluctant to sort of lease or negotiate because they might lose their their rights and, and so they're kind of still hanging on to that it also looks bad if they stop farming and then all the, the community that depends on them uh, but this offers the foundations that are trying to do those in-stream flows to get the water back in the ground or back in the river uh, not just one farmer to deal with or 10 farmers but 35,000 other people to deal with so we're counting on them to sort of help uh, beef up the market and, and, and 
and drive, I think they'll put a higher value on the price of water um, than, uh, uh, than an everyday person. Um, and, uh, and then find a way of, of measuring the impact and, and revealing. You know, what, what is three endangered species worth? I mean, they're, they're salmon, I, I love salmon and so forth, but what are they worth? And there was no way to do that, so we had to sort of use uh, the stick of, of regulation, and, and that was going to cost, I think, $100 million. And so that's why Sonoma is excited to see if this thing works, which we're going to hopefully be piloting this summer, because you know, with a fraction of that, they can start paying people with the, the carrot to use less water instead of you know, the, the stick. Sir? Um, if you're using historic usage as the way to set the baseline for either above or below, yep. doesn't that sort of just solidify and entrench any injustices that are already there in terms of water usage? Yep. Um, that's a very good question. That's, that's what I've been wrestling with, especially with, with fisheries as well. When we initially conceived this, um, we were sort of going, okay, we've got to find a compromise between Maud Barlow of the UN and the human right to water, uh, which sounds beautiful. Everybody wants to have a human right to water. Everyone believes in the human right to water. But it gets messy in terms of like, well, how much water? And who pays for it? And um, if you get 100 gallons free, does that just not incentivize you to waste it? But we're saying, okay, let's, let's try to put it into practice and say, you know, whatever the median use is, that's going to be the threshold. Um, and so 50% of people would automatically be, yeah, you yeah, know, we're, we're, we're below the threshold, we're, we're winners. And then the other people would be like, oh, this sucks, we're, we're having to pay more for that because um, uh, we're, we're above that. That would be contentious, that would be, you know, uh, lead to, to more pushback, more fighting, more lawsuits and so forth. Um, and so then we started ex exploring and saying, well, what if you did base it on historic use? Because then, if you're using more water, you're paying more for it. Uh, you're, you're at a higher bracket, you're paying, if you're using 1,000 gallons, you may be paying $500 uh, uh, a month for it. If you're using 100 gallons, you know, a, a tenth of that. Um, so you're still paying uh, in terms of how much water you use. But what's different is now the water itself has value. It's, it's taken me a long time to figure it out, and I want you to bear with me. When we pay for water, when we get our water bill, like the one I showed there, it's like, oh, okay, uh, $100, $100 or whatever, we're not paying for the water. We're paying for the pipes, we're paying for the chemicals, we're paying for the pumping, the lifting, the moving, the treating, the heating of that water. We're not paying for the water itself. And that's, that's what's behind a lot of these paradoxes. So then, letting people sort of negotiate of, if I save this much, what's it worth, finally does give value to something um, that had been both priceless and worthless. Um, does it entrench the inequities? I don't think it does entrench it. It's, it, it rewards people who are at a higher level of use for using less. Um, and uh, the, the inequity for me was if you sort of say, we're gonna ration everybody 10%, and you're using 100 gallons a day, and I'm using 1,000 gallons a day, you're gonna be suffering much more under that rationing system than I would be. I go down to 900 gallons, you go down to 90. I don't really have to change my way of life very much. Um, so it's a very valid question, it's a very real concern, um, and I'm not trying to whitewash it. And I, I, we, can, we can keep talking about it, but it's, it's the best system since people have been paying for that water all along, and would continue paying for that amount of water um, and having an incentive still to conserve. So you have 100 people incentivized to use less instead of 50%. There's another question. Can we just do another yep. question? Yep. No. Well, I'm sure there'll be many more, uh, right? but why don't we, we give yep. um, uh, Mr. Woodley an opportunity to speak, and then and we'll have a few questions and answers, and then we'll, we'll put everybody up here, and we'll have a full debate. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Um, only in a place like Vermont Law School, we have such a turnout as this, two weeks before the reading period begins. This is fantastic. Um, our second speaker is equally distinguished. Uh, John Paul Woodley is a, um, uh, a resident of Virginia, a native of Virginia. Native of Louisiana. You can tell. Right? Um, and he's had an enormously distinguished career. Uh, he served as the Secretary of Natural Resources in the great state of Virginia, where he had 
overall responsibility for environmental permitting and uh, fisheries and water resources in that state. Uh, and then uh, uh, he served in the administration of uh, President George W. Bush in a couple of capacities. Uh, first, uh, as the principal environmental advisor to the Secretary of Defense, uh, and then as the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, that is the guy who runs the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, do you get to wear a uniform? Are you? you no, didn't, I, I was a civilian. You're a civilian. I, that's I got the, to wear a hard hat. That's the big distinction. <laughs> uh, as, as a lawyer, that was very deep. <laughs> and in that position, uh, he uh, was engaged in, in, in leading the, the far-flung efforts of the, of the Army Corps of Engineers in a whole range of interesting uh, arenas, including uh, reestablishing hurricane protection uh, for the great city of New Orleans, uh, leading the, uh, the Everglades restoration effort, uh, developing uh, mitigation uh, banking policies. Uh, so he has just an enormous uh, wealth of experience, and we're really uh, privileged to have you here. And, and have you share your perspectives with us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Hey, James, that was one of the nicest PowerPoints I've uh, had the privilege of seeing. I uh, have uh, six, or I should say eight, eight long years in the Pentagon put me permanently off PowerPoint. Uh, and so uh, I'm not going to present one for you today. Uh, I guess if, if uh, uh, you ask hard enough, I'll, I'll work one up for you. But uh, I want to thank the law school, uh, its chapter, the Federal Society, uh, Tyler Ward, who's been instrumental in putting this together, uh, and the Kaufman Foundation for the opportunity to be with you. And it's a real privilege to share the uh, podium uh, with James, such an innovative thinker in the area of water resource development. Uh, we have, uh, uh, could be talking here today and, and, and spend the whole time that we have together talking about aspects of uh, the challenges of water resources, uh, uh, drought that uh, has uh, uh, gripped the country over the past year. And if we go back one year before that, uh, we had record levels of flooding in the uh, uh, Mississippi and Missouri River Valleys, uh, and of course, more recently, the coastal flooding uh, in the uh, uh, Northeast from Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we could talk about the challenges presented by uh, water pollution. Uh, so many of our streams across the country are impaired uh, for their uh, designated uses because of uh, water pollution that, that has uh, numerous sources, point and non-point. Uh, we could talk about uh, the water, the shortages of water that exist, uh, even in areas that, that previously uh, had abundance, uh, and we could talk about those in terms of uh, domestic and, and, and industrial uses and the water resource uh, conflicts that exist. We could discuss the various uh, uh, conflicts, resource specific resource use conflicts, uh, that uh, many of whom, of whom or many of which bedeviled my life when I was serving uh, in the Bush administration and serving in, in, as the uh, civilian responsible for the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, but uh, uh, we're not gonna talk about any of that. I'm instead, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna tell you the story that I meant to tell you before I got started on all this. Vermont, you know, is, I've, I've learned is uh, very proud of its natural resource uh, base, its natural resource heritage. So driving right down Interstate uh, 89, and I saw, I don't know how many uh, uh, deer stands, or maybe the moose stands, I don't know the country. I did see a moose crossing, which is kind of unique. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, so these deer stands, people, the people are hunting within about uh, 50 yards of the interstate highway, and I hope they are not, you know, shoot, I hope they have a, something set up to where they know not to shoot at the traffic. But uh, <coughs> brings to mind a story that uh, actually a fairly tragic story that I learned when I was. Uh, working in the natural resource arena in, in Virginia, and uh, this was uh, 
Uh, one of the things I had to do in my portfolio was the Game and Inland Fisheries, so I managed the agency that helped uh, with uh, uh, game and, and, uh, uh, and, and fisheries in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, there was a couple that was newly married in Virginia, and they were, uh, uh, the uh, young lady bride was a urban girl, and uh, the young man was uh, more from a rural area and was a very avid hunter of deer whatever else, uh, turkey, whatever else could be shot. But at any rate, they loved each other very much, and they had, over time, grown to where th this having this thing where she had no hunting background at all, and having this thing where he they couldn't share this important aspect of their lives was, was very difficult. And so they decided that, that, sure enough, she would learn to hunt. You know, you can't just go out and do that nowadays. You, gotta, you have to go through the... Uh, process. You have to go through firearm safety uh, training and learn the laws of hunting and when the seasons are open and and what the what what land can be hunted on and what cannot. And so they went through this entire process. And then so then there came the day they were ready for her to have her first hunt. They set up in one of these blinds, like the ones of, uh, off of Interstate uh, 89. And he said, now this is, you know, this is clearing here, and you know, if a deer comes in, just, you, you know what to do, you shoot her, I'll, hear, I'll be in the next blind down, and I'll certainly hear that report of that shot, and I'll come immediately and, and, and deal with, you know, when, when you shoot a deer, that's not the end of the story. There's any hunters in the room, you can't just, you know, shoot them and wander off. There's a lot of work to be done at, at, after, that, uh, after that thing. That's, but, Anyway, he, he was ready to do that for her uh, as, uh, as part of the deal. Uh, but anyway, uh, so be that as it may, after a while, he set up in the blind and she was ready to, uh, uh, ready to hunt. And, and soon uh, he heard the bang! And he said, oh, well, she, she, she must have, uh, from that direction. So he climbs down out of the thing, comes around, and he, then he hears bang, bang! I said, and he, and he hears her shout, get away, you get away, that's my deer, you get away from my deer, and bang, and he's, then he breaks, he's what in the world, he breaks into the clearing, and he sees a man standing in there with his hands in the air saying, lady, I don't want your deer, I just want to get my saddle off of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as I say, this is something of a, a tragic story, but it illustrates some of these resource use conflicts <laughs> that exist in, in the natural resource arena. Um, any, do we have people here from the Missouri River? Uh, from the Missouri River uh, area. So that, that, that the, uh, uh, one of the great uh, conflicts and resource use conflicts today is between the recreational uh, uh, aspects of the, uh, that exist on the great reservoirs of the, uh, of the upper Missouri, the uh, largest reservoir system in the world, uh, capable of holding 72 million acre feet of water. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, and, and nearly at capacity. When I was in office, it was, it was in the, it was holding in the 30 million acre feet of, of and, and there were places, uh, there were cities that had, that had to move their intake for water uh, in North Dakota eight miles because the, wa the, the lake reservoir had, uh, area had, uh, had shrunk to that degree uh, uh, and, and they were chasing that water across the landscape. Uh, uh, then last year, as I think I meant, as I mentioned, or year before last, uh, as I mentioned, record floods in the Missouri River system that almost uh, led the uh, system to go all the way to capacity of, of, its, of its reservoirs, the largest reservoir system in the world. Uh, but uh, race, the conflict there is, some of that water is used to support riverine navigation from uh, Sioux City, Iowa, to uh, the confluence with the Missouri River near St. Louis, Missouri. 
And when the water is released in times of drought for purposes of navigation, the people in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana uh, feel that uh, that water is wasted. And the people in uh, Missouri and the farmers along that river that use that means of navigation to get their uh, products to market uh, have a different point of view. Do we have people here from the Deep South, uh, Georgia, Florida, or uh, Alabama? That's closer to my part of the country, I guess. But uh, uh, <clears throat> in that case, you would want to you would want to learn about the uh, conflicts between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida regarding the ACT ACF system. The reason we call it the ACT ACF system is that its real name is the Alabama Coosa Tallapoosa. Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint. <laughs> so we call it the ACT ACF. Uh, the, uh, it's one of the best uh, arguments for acronyms I've ever heard. The uh, uh, arguments are there concern uh, water use for the city of Atlanta, one of the great metropolitan uh, centers of this nation, uh, versus the downstream uses in Florida, at Apalachicola Bay and uh, in Alabama to support ongoing uh, industrial and, and uh, other development uh, and uses downstream. We talked about the Columbia River, it's another area in which the uh, area around Seattle uh, and uh, Portland, uh, have, and Portland and Oregon and, and in uh, uh, Washington State have developed immensely because of the, of the abundant and inexpensive hydropower from the system of dams on the Columbia River. It also supports navigation all the way from uh, uh, Idaho. But it also interrupts the run of salmon uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, it, the <coughs> conflict between those salmon and the hydropower and navigation has as continues and, and was was very interesting. So, we've add, I could add to that areas of uh, that that are emerging of challenges aquifer depletion from the uses of aquifers. Uh, more and more uh, agricultural uses going deeper and deeper to get water that is that is depleting is, is recharging at a, a high, very inadequate rate based on or compared to the depletion. Uh, the aging, I could talk about the aging uh, of our navigation inf infrastructure that on, ri on rivers, if you uh, look at the uh, nation uh, uh, and, and look at the great uh, river navigation system that the Corps of Engineers supports all the way from uh, above Pittsburgh, indeed, in, into, into uh, West Virginia, uh, through down the Ohio River the Ohio and, and from the uh, upper reaches of the Mississippi. Uh, down to the Mississippi, uh, that brings the uh, grain of Middle America to market at the at the port of New Orleans. And really, uh, don't tell anybody I said this, but that is why Katrina was a problem. Okay, uh, without it, I mean, other than I'm sorry, the, the people were killed and a lot of things were things happened. But the reason that cut the nation had to rebuild New Orleans was because. Without it, Ohio, uh, Ohio, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Minnesota, Missouri, uh, Missouri cannot get their products to market. And so uh, that is the, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm as, I have as much fun on Bourbon Street as anybody else, but you know, that's not the point of rebuilding the, the system of levees to protect New Orleans. The point is that this nation needs a viable, vibrant community at that location, at the outlet of the Mississippi, Ohio River, Missouri system to the sea. And Thomas Jefferson knew it and, and bought it. And he said the, the nation that owns, that controls New Orleans is the natural enemy of this country. And uh, as soon as it came on the market, he bought the dam, <laughs> even though he had no authority to, according to many constitutional scholars. But I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk instead about the institutional challenges that 
prevent us in many ways and many times, prevent us effectively and efficiently uh, from addressing these issues as a nation. So I want to talk, I want to describe first of all some of our dysfunctional institutions. And this is not uh, at any, by any means, a, you know, the, and I want to know, I want to, these are great institutions of democracy that, that, that we all should admire, but they are, have a difficult time and they are currently dysfunctional in the area of water resource development. And the first to, to discuss is the most important, Article I of the Constitution, the Congress. We have a, a Congress that is currently is dysfunctional in the area of water resource development. <coughs> Uh, and I want to describe, first of all, some of the reasons for that. I want to talk about the, why I say that, but the, probably the most significant reason is that the, that the Congress is not organized properly for handling water resource development issues. It is not, it, it, is, uh, it, it consists of fragmented committee jurisdiction with the committees uh, that are, uh, and the Senate is better than the House in this regard. But the committees that should uh, deal with water resource development on a whole, in, a, in, a, in a holistic and, and uh, a comprehensive way are uh, uh, divided, and they are so they have some committees in the House, the committees that deal with the Corps of Engineers uh, and, and water resources. A different committee deals with the Department of Interior. A different committee in. in, uh, in Another different separate committee will be dealing and handle issues regarding the Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, and they uh, uh, and then uh, it, it, all of those committees are separate from the committees that fund each of these programs on the appropriation side. Uh, on the appropriations in the appropriations arena, in particular, the. Uh, Area has been a, su a subject of a tremendous controversy in Congress that, that is, is, has led to the ban on earmarks in Congress. I wonder, is that is that something that uh, earmarks in, in the appropriation process is something that you have uh, generally been familiar with? I want to, if I get some nods, I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, the the water resource development has been handled in Congress largely on the basis of, of, of the earmarks process. And it was, it was therefore, the, the, the water, process, water projects, uh, whether it was Interior Department, uh, through the Bureau of Reclamation, or the Corps of Engineers, were an issue for trade-off. It was part of the, the currency on Capitol Hill. One of the things that was, one of those things that was able to be traded and uh, uh, bartered uh, for, uh, for votes to make other issues go forward. And this was sometimes good, but more often not so good. And the current, uh, and so it, it became a, quite a scandal, not in the, actually not so much in the water arena. Uh, the scandals that, that developed were in, more in the transportation arena. You've heard of the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. I mean, no one can defend that. Uh, you've heard of the uh, uh, airport in Pennsylvania named after a powerful member of Congress, except the only person ever known to fly there and land was the member himself. Uh, these things cannot be defended, and they led to the scandal, the uh, scandals that led to what's known as the earmarks ban. The problem is with that is that they, I believe, have succeeded in throwing the proverbial baby out with the proverbial bathwater. And they don't seem to be any, any way to find anybody who's capable of yet today of, uh, of retrieving that baby. Because I think there was a baby in that bathwater and I think it's going out the window and I think somebody needs to go pick it up and bring it back in. <laughs> but, okay, here's another reason Congress is, is dysfunctional. Do you know that the Corps of Engineers, when, and when it does a, a, a civil works program, a, a civil works project, okay? Let's say it plans a $100 million civil works project. 
which is not really that big a civil works project. And it says it's going to take 10 years. Well, for, of course, that doesn't mean that it's, it's going to take $100 million. It just means over time it's going to, uh, that, that it's not $10 million every year for 10 years. It's, what happens is actually that for the first three or four years, a bunch of guys dressed kind of like me work on a thing. Most of, the, you know, some, most of them not wearing ties. And a lot of gals nowadays, too, by the way. I'm dating myself. Uh, but the, uh, uh, they, they get to work on it, and, uh, and that's, that work is cheap. Okay, so, that, so a $100 million project in year one might spend a million dollars. And then and they scribble, you know, they do plans. They're doing plans, they're doing, the, uh, you know, uh, all the paperwork that needs to be done to, to get the project done. Then after a while, uh, uh, suddenly a bunch of people who are not dressed at all like me, dress somewhat like the gentleman in the ball cap uh, in the back of the room, uh, show up in boots, yeah, just someone like the other gentleman in the ball cap. There you go. They show up in boots, and the boot, and, and they and they pour a lot of concrete, and and, and they uh, uh, suddenly things grow. A whole bunch. I mean, there's an army of people shows up, and and they and, and anyway, the project goes up in the air, and is built, and that's when they're spending money. The point I want to make is that Congress, at the beginning of the process does not give the Corps of Engineers, does not appropriate the $100 million. They, they know it's going to cost $100 million, according to the estimates under the feasibility study. But they say, see, this is year one. We'll give you a million dollars. Come back in year two and tell us how much you need for year two. Come back and so the Corps goes, okay, okay, year two we need another million dollars. Okay, we do. And then say year three, well, now we need $40 million because the uh, guys in the ball caps have showed up, you know, and muddy boots, and they're, and they're actually working. They have to be paid. And, then, and, and so the Congress says, $40 million? Well, they, that project was only $1 million last year. They, they actually know better. They, they talk this way because they, they know better. They, they act shocked, but they, know that they knew that it was coming. And we say, yeah, $40 million. And they say, gee, gosh, I don't know. Uh, can you make do with 20? And the answer is, yeah. But it's not going to, remember we said we'd be finished in five years or 10 years or whatever. If you don't fund it efficiently, the 10 years, forget it. We're doing, it's now 15 years. It's now 20 years. And you look at Civil Works project, projects and say, why does it take you 20 years to build something that, that you knew that, that, that if you were, that, that, that should take most people, normal people a year, to, you know, three years to build. Well, that's the reason. It's very simple. It's not a mystery. There is no other, I'm unaware of any other uh, infrastructure program, uh, construction program funded in this way in the history of mankind or anywhere else in the civilized world. Okay? It is stupid. <laughs> Okay? But it's what we do. It's the American system. And if you don't believe me, go ask your congressman. He'll ask a staffer and you'll get another. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we talk about the uh, Water Resource Development Acts. This is the Authorization Act process for uh, water projects. And it is, it is almost completely broken. It has, it has been, it was dead from the year 2001 to the year 2007 when the Water Resource Development Act of 2007 was passed. That act was only passed, it was passed over the veto of President Bush, the veto message that I wrote, more in sor sorrow than in anger, because it had authorized $32 billion of new projects, uh, some of which were really stupid, some of which were very, very important and some of which we wanted. And we say, guys, if you get, send the president a bill that, that has the right, has the, the things in here that are, that, that, can, that are really gonna do good, and we'll sign that. This thing is bloated, and we're gonna veto it. Well, they, they, they passed it because the reason it was bloated was it had everybody's idea in there for how to get money out of the CORE's program, including the one that I like best, which was the Maryland and North Dakota uh, 
infrastructure, the water infrastructure program. I said, what the hell was that? And then you look and say, oh, well, okay, the subcommittee chairs, one's from Maryland, the other's from North Dakota. So they put their they they put their power together and got this section and also like because because the two, I'm sure you have nothing to do with one another. They don't actually meet anywhere south uh, anywhere short of the water resources committee and uh, or the the transportation infrastructure committee in Washington D.C. But there they were, shackled together forever in the Water Resource Development Act. So it was passed over our, our veto, and that's fine. Uh, it was not that it's not necessarily a bad thing, although uh, the uh, since then they have not been able to continue and, and do another uh, water resource development act uh, since 2000. Now since 2007, now almost five years. So, and the reason that's important is that should be a two-year process. That, that should be a process in which those, those resources are looked at again and reevaluated for every every second year. Now, we could, I've, I've spent a lot of time on Congress. They are the most important. The administration is also dysfunctional. Why? Fragmented responsibilities. Look at it. EPA, water quality and drinking water. NOAA fisheries, salt water. Department of Interior, they're fragmented internally. Fish and Wildlife Service, Threatened and Endangered Species, Bureau of Reclamation for uh, water resource development in the 17 Western states. Department of Commerce, and what you, uh, well, I'll, I'll, if somebody asks me the question, I'll explain why that happened. Department of Commerce, dealing with uh, navigation issues. Homeland Security, dealing with navigation safety. FEMA, dealing with flood response and flood insurance. And finally, in the Department of Defense, where? The Department of Defense, why? Because in 1802, the only engineer school in the country was West Point. <laughs> you know, that, so that's where, that's where the Army, the, it, the nation's engineers became, uh, started coming out of the Army. Navigation, flood control, ecosystem restoration, hydroelectric power, Corps of Engineers produces 25% uh, of the hydroelectric power produced in this country. Okay. And the Army, what, what the, you know, what's that have to do with, with, with defending the country? I, nothing, okay? Uh, so that fragmentation leads to a, a, a diffusion of responsibility, and where there is a diffusion of responsibility, there is, a, 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 you, you're, you're left with a dysfunctional system. Now, I'll briefly touch on the dysfunctional courts. Anyone who's read any of uh, the, the recent set of, of recent cases of NEPA litigation, you can name as many as you like, uh, can, can tell you that the courts, have, you know, NEPA is, a, uh, a, is like a zombie uh, stalking through the corridors of law, eating the brains of the living. But uh, who can, what have we seen in this world in jurisprudence that can compare with the Rapanos decision? Huh? I mean, who, give me a show of hands. Somebody read that, all those opinions? You've read them? You've read them? Okay, this is, this is a wonderful thing. What we have is we have four justices on one side. We have four justices on the other side. And we have Justice Kennedy in the middle, okay? The only thing the other eight agree on is that Justice Kennedy's opinion is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the decision? What is the rule of law? Answer me this question, legal scholars. What is the rule of law that the Corps of Engineers and the EPA, the great institutional agencies of our, of our federal sovereignty, are implementing today? The Justice Kennedy opinion! <laughs> the one that the eight, eight, eight members of the court say is bullshit! Okay, is this a great country or what? Huh? Okay, so the courts are, I mean, I just say, leave it alone. You know, every time they say, oh, well, gee. in fact, my people in the regulatory program, I had a great fondness for them when, I was, when they worked for me. And they came and said, oh, this is so great. They've, been, they've granted certiorari. We're going to get some some real certainty on this jurisdiction issue. That's going to be so good, Mr. Woodley. And I said, God, how, how can I, how can I, 
How can I do this? They're so beautiful. They're so good. So, so sweet. You know, how can I disabuse them of that? But I knew it was going to happen, frankly. <laughs> and, uh, and it did. And, but uh, we can talk further. How about the fragmentation of authority and responsibility? State versus local in the war arena. Very difficult issues there across the board. Some states do better than, than others. Uh, Oklahoma. For instance, I could point to pretty good, Texas. Uh, but um, state, and then federal versus state. I want to read to you briefly from the recently uh, very important document in water resource development, the principles and requirements for federal investments in water resources, March 2013, hot off the print. The federal government's role in water resource related activities has changed over time. In many cases, the federal government is no longer the primary investor in or developer and protector of water resources related activities across the nation. Increasingly, the solutions put forth to address the complex water resource problems facing the nation involve activities by many other entities at varying levels of scale and scope. State, tribal, local governments, private entity, nonprofit participation is to be actively encouraged in all aspects of water resource planning. This is a fundamental planning document guiding planning efforts by the federal government in water resource development areas. So my time is up. I want to go briefly though into my prescriptions because they, I think you'll find they dovetail very nicely with James. I don't have a set of prescriptions here, but I want to say some principles that should tell, that you should guide, that you should, should measure them against. And the first is that let's go back and remember the market-based approaches, the benefits that we get, and the and the and the benefits to humanity that the uh, markets have brought uh, for many many generations now, and and the use of market mechanisms and market-based approaches uh, to uh, uh, to deal with water resource conflicts. The second is remember that we are Americans. Maximize freedom in what you do. Maximize the freedom of the individual, maximize the freedom of people who want to uh, make their lives better at, at, at whatever uh, level they are. And minimize the top-down uh, uh, regulatory uh, type approaches and, and when they're necessary to use because you're, of, of, of your uh, uh, the necess necessity of, of internalizing externalities like we have to do then go back to rule one. Remember your market-based approaches. And finally, develop efficient conflict resolution and consistent, consistent development mechanisms at every level. Uh, uh, gridlock is not gonna get us uh, past this, uh, these water resource development conflicts and, and challenges. So thank you very, very much for having me here. insider perspective on what goes on there in the court engineer. Why don't we take a couple of questions before we reassemble the panel if people have happy to. Um, you mentioned that one of the problems is that everything is so fragmented, the responsibility, but you also encourage us to sort of avoid centralized regulatory authority, a functional centralized regulatory authority. So how do you find the balance in between allowing the government to have too much control, whereas right now they've basically paralyzed themselves out of the area. Uh, the, and uh, <clears throat> you put your finger on a very important point there, but the, the, the remember the market concept. The market concept is that, that there is an, if, there, that if you devise the, the if, it's a, if it's a properly devised market, then the invisible hand will take take place or take over. But the, the, the uh, point is that, it, that you can't get there uh, and, and you can't develop that kind of, fr of, of framework if the responsibility for doing so is too fragmented. So, uh, you know, you, you, in some sense, you have to centralize within the government and, 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 and get the players within the government together and, uh, uh, and understanding their roles and understanding how their 
uh, have their roles dovetail with one another before you can create that framework. That's, and that's uh, the, how the two, that, that's how that tension is resolved. But it, you're, you're, uh, it's certainly, I mean, it's, of course, not unique to this arena, but, uh, but, but that's how I would, would describe it. And none of these people have response, have, have, and there's nobody here with the kind of responsibility to think in, the, in, in terms of what, we're, what, we talk, what James talked about earlier. Who in the, in the, who in the structure would, would, would feel it their responsibility to think in those terms and to, and to put a, a concept like uh, James was talking about into place and it, and in, in within the system? And the answer is really, it's hard to find somebody. And that's a problem. infrastructure is that there's been so much public uh, money put into infrastructure. And so if the government starts to move away or out of the picture in terms of uh, at least control or in terms of how the water is marketed, then the, what do you foresee or how do you imagine the role of government? Does it still play the same role in terms of infrastructure? Or does somebody else or other players come in to fill that, fill that space? Well, certainly, you will never have uh, a, a, you never be able to push the government entirely out of the space by any means. That's that, that's not in the cards. However, uh, what I would uh, suggest is that the uh, uh, government is pulling itself back. If you and you certainly, if you read the, the as I that's the point I was making in reading that. Uh, um, sort of bureaucratic passage out of the principles and requirements that, that's just been issued. But they're telling you the federal government is not going to be there anymore. And if you look at the, the other thing that happened this week is the uh, Corps of Engineers issued its, uh, or the, the President's administration issued the uh, budget for fiscal year 2014 that's supposed to begin in, at the 1st of October of this year. Uh, and in that budget, they uh, actually substantially reduce the uh, uh, levels of construction of infrastructure uh, compared to uh, prior years. When I was uh, assistant secretary, a typical construction budget for, for a year was in the $2 billion range. This year, $1.3 billion. That's a great deal of money. but. It is less than it has been. So the, the federal government is pulling itself back. That means other players and, and, and more and innovative concepts <laughs> for funding infrastructure need to come forward. They, that means that the infrastructure, if, if, if it's going to be involved with private, public-private partnerships types of things, what does that mean? That means the infrastructure has got to throw off revenue. How does, it, how does the infrastructure throw off revenue? Well, if it's a reservoir, maybe it sells hydroelectric power. Maybe it sells water or the right to use water. Maybe it, it, it uh, if it's a navigation project, maybe it uh, pays, maybe people pay tolls, I don't know. But in order for public-private partnerships to work, I'll try saying that fast, uh, three times fast, uh, the, uh, in order for that to work, uh, it's got to throw off, the project itself has to throw off a, a stream of revenue. And where that's really difficult is in the flood control arena. You, you're gonna, you know, every time there's a flood, you go out, you, you have to collect from people 1% of what they would have lost if their home would have gone underwater. I'm not sure exactly how you, how you, it, you know, you could do it with a special taxation district. Some places have done that, but that's not a very popular idea either. So. Jimmy, why don't we come up here and we'll, we'll have a short panel discussion, if that's all right. Um, and I don't know if, if Jamie, you have some comments for John, or John, you have some comments for Jamie, and um, interchange among our speakers. Jamie, you're, you go, you're a free market advocate. You, you're, no, you're, I, I, I couldn't agree more. You, you, the government has to be the, there. Take I, think, the court. I think you had a great question in terms of um, that balance. And to me, everybody here has heard of 350.org probably. Um, to me, that's the role of government. Say, this is the target. We cannot go above that, we've gone beyond that. But that's the target we're gonna get back to. 
And then it's up to you guys to figure out how to do so. I'm a big advocate of cap and, and, and dividend. I think of the same thing in terms of the government says, this is, you know, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, um, or this is Lake Powell, or, or this is, you know, the storage for the uh, Atlanta's water supply. And that is something we hold in trust. But what's that water worth? That's up to you guys to decide. And I've, I've become, again, a big advocate of, of the wisdom of crowds, um, which is that, you know, nine very wise men in, in uh, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court can make a decision. It's going to be an okay decision. Um, 435 people, you know, make a decision about something. It's going to be maybe, you know, it's not the one any of us like, but it's, it's up there. If you could have 32 million people in the Colorado River Basin deciding what the value of the water is and how it should be used in that basin, you will have a far wiser, more equitable and efficient use of that water uh, with a lot less conflict. So it's, um, those are the things I was, I was just thinking and, and, and taking a few notes on uh, of trying to strike that balance of infrastructure, what's it worth, while well, we devalue it, devalue it and, and then uh, what it contains, what, what the water held back within that uh, 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 that infrastructure is, is something else. Well, let me exercise my privilege as a moderator to make a couple of provocative remarks. Um, um, these were just, I can't tell you what great presentations. You, you recognize, you, you, you heard great presentations, but both of these people are incredibly sophisticated, knowledgeable people who've thought a great deal about water resources, been at the center of important water resource decisions, so it's really a privilege to, uh, to hear from them. Um, Jamie, uh, it's, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but it seems to me one of the fundamental uh, uh, challenge, one of the fundamental challenges facing your agenda is, is the question of what to do about the fish. Uh, because the fish don't have pocketbooks, they don't have wallets, they're not market actors, uh, they can't express themselves in the marketplace, they can't compete with the utilities, and they can't compete with the farmers. Uh, and so how does that interest uh, get reflected in the market? And you know, you mentioned there are foundations, and there's a nature conservancy, and there's a you know, there are groups like Water Watch and so on, and so there's some money going into water conservation, but you know, if I'm a, a rational, self-interested uh, economic actor and I like to fish, well, you know, I'm inclined to just, you know, let somebody else worry about the water, you know. It's, you know, it's a, there's a big free rider problem when it comes to investing uh, in water resources. And beyond that, this is, this is what economists call a great big collective action problem. There are, mi there are millions of us fishermen, right? We're a very unwieldy group to organize. It's one thing for an agribusiness in Texas or in California to sort of figure out how much water it needs and to bid for that, but it's a lot harder for the, 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 the salmon fishermen in, in the Northwest to figure out, you know, organize themselves and express themselves in the market. So you know, one of the, the traditional criticisms you hear about, about reliance on the market is environmental interests are simply going to lose out in the market. This, the second thing I wanted to throw out is, is, is sort of the property law question. I, I teach nothing but property here so I, at this law school. I teach first year property, I teach water resources, which is just aquatic property, and then I teach watershed, and that's just sort of property on a watershed basis. Um, and one of the things my students, or some of them in the room have learned, is when you're talking about water, you're talking about very attenuated interests in water. Um, you, the, a, a person who owns a water interest obviously doesn't own the physical water, but they do possess a use of factory interest. But beyond that, at least in, in a state like California, that use of factory interest is subject to a number of really important limitations. One of them is waste. Uh, that you do not have an entitlement to use water in a wasteful manner. You may have used 1,000 acre feet of water for the last 20 years, but if that's a wasteful use of water, the public, the state is entitled to ratchet you back in order to eliminate the waste. Um, under the public trust doctrine, as, as affirmed by the California Supreme Court, no owner of an appropriate right in, right in California has a right to use water in a way that's harmful to the fish of other public trust values. And furthermore, the courts have said that all those limitations are going to evolve over time. This is the common law, and, and what's wasteful today may not have been wasteful 20 years ago. What's offensive to the public trust doctrine has to be evaluated in light of contemporary values and contemporary circumstances. Those doctrines, which are kind of bedrock parts of California law, make it really hard to define fixed, fixed rights in water in California. 
such that you can trade them in a market. So let me just throw out those two big problems. I'm sure you've dealt with them before. No, they're, 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 they're both very good. I, my only thing I take issue is, is, is the word <coughs> agenda. I, I, I'm not sure I have an agenda. <laughs> I, I, I would like to make a profit if this business can work or whatever, but mostly I'm curious from an intellectual standpoint of, of what people decide water <coughs> is really worth. The, the first question you had is can fish compete with agriculture, with industry, with commerce? And I, I would unequivocally say yes. Um, that they can compete not only from a moral standpoint, you know, there's people say we need to have the Endangered Species Act in place and we've put that in place and that's not going away despite repeated attempts to, to do away with it. But better than that, it can compete with industry and agriculture from a monetary point of view. That's uh, Silicon Valley can use an acre foot of water to generate a thousand times more jobs, a thousand times more revenue from withdrawing the same amount of water. Leaving that water in the stream can generate far more money through recreation, through fishery, through attracting the, the real estate values of people that want to live in these places where water runs through the, through the river. Um, it's, a, it's a balance as, as an economy that improves, as it gets more developed. People want these amenity values of, of fishing, of knowing the fish are there, the existence value, the, the free-flowing river. It's one of the reasons why we're removing dams today faster than we're building them. Um, that's something we can do in an affluent economy, but it's also one that we can do where the value of recreation and fish is worth more than the value of hydropower, of industry, and of agriculture. Um, the usufruct rights, um, uh, I, I'm, again, I'm not a lawyer. I've been focusing mostly on, on the utilities because they are basically utility has the city has one water right and what I'm trying to do is create tens of thousands even millions of little water rights within that uh, we're just calling them eco shares or credits because right supplies uh, a legal recourse um, and saying you can't own that water but you can own the the credit uh, that saving generates the thing I've been wrestling with on, on usufruct rights is that it is based, at least in California, and I believe in other Western waters, on this phrase, reasonable and beneficial use. That you can maintain your property right to water if you can demonstrate reasonable and beneficial use. And that phrase is, is wonderful to me because it's so loaded and it's so vague uh, as to leave open all kinds of interpretations. And it also implies sort of it e either is reasonable and beneficial or it's not. There's no sort of like scale. I believe there is a scale, and I believe from a political spectrum, sort of like from my first answer, it's, it's going to weigh harder and harder to say that it is reasonable and beneficial to withdraw 500 <coughs> acre feet to generate 20 jobs and a thousand dollars when that same amount could be withdrawn to generate far more. And the market would allow for water to go towards its higher value, to go towards the fish, to go towards industry, to go towards the, the uses that don't deplete the river uh, as much uh, and, and do so much more efficiently. Um, like, uh, you know, we, we'd heard of, of, of the reason why New Orleans is in place is, is for the, um, uh, the navigation uses and, and all these up, upstream states need, that's, that's the only way they can get their, their products out to market. I, I, that was part I, I did disagree. They can get their products out to market any different ways. There's highways and so forth coming from it. But the difference is they pay three cents uh, a ton to do it via the Mississippi and Missouri, whereas they, they'd have to pay four or five or 10 cents to do so on the railways or, or, or freeways. Um, that this small group can, can capture the entire beneficial and reasonable use of, of the Missouri ecosystem uh, is one of those, those skews that I guess I, I do have an agenda to try to disrupt, um, to say if they, if they want to do that, they're going to have to pay the difference. Um, but um, again, I'm, I'm working at a scale, at a, at a utility level, uh, more than at a, at a, at a scale. <coughs> Let me just ask one more question. Um, as, as you both know, Bruce Babbitt would periodically say some, some inflammatory and outrageous <laughs> things. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Jamie got to work for Bruce Babbitt. I guess it was after. I, he, I, he, I put those inflammatory things in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> He talked about tearing down dams and you know, ripping up the uh, Mining Act. And, 
Um, but one of the things he said, and I think it was after he left office, um, uh, he said, uh, in light of the storm damage in, in New Orleans, um, it's just it would be a terrible mistake to rebuild the city of New Orleans uh, on its current footprint. Uh, we're facing rising seas, we're going to face more and more storms, uh, and, and basically New Orleans as we know it now is indefensible. And, the, and New Orleans ought to be reconstructed, the historic core ought to be protected, the Garden District, the French, the French District, and otherwise we ought to turn the rest of it um, back into, into swamp and, and not invest the money in trying to rebuild um, uh, New Orleans as it is today. There was a debate that went on uh, back and forth about that, and then after about a year, the decision was made, no, we're gonna get the Army Corps of Engineers to come in here and put in new levees, and we are gonna build, rebuild New Orleans, not with the same population, mind you, but with the population we've got left, we're gonna rebuild New Orleans on exactly the same footprint that it existed on before. So, I, uh, I put it to you, Mr. Woodley, do you think Bruce Babbitt was out to lunch, or do you think he had something to tell you, there was some merit to his thinking? Well, no, I, I want to address that. The, uh, I, I don't think, I said between Thomas Jefferson and Bruce Babbitt, I'll take Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> so you're, you're a defender. You um, ought to defend. I, uh, I think that, that okay, <clears throat> let's back up a little bit. There's about four places in the world that are capable of producing uh, grain crops for export, uh, export on a global scale. Uh, the Pampas, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Ukraine, you, you know, the, 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 there's some, there's one, in, at least one in Asia, and there's the upper Midwest in the United States. Uh, that is a, that grain for export uh, to prevent global hunger is a commodity that is um, governed at the tenths of a cent per ton of transportation cost range. A tow of barges using riverine transport is capable of uh, at much less, at, at, at an incredible, of an incredible level of efficiency. I'm not the statistician to tell you this, but I'm talking about orders of magnitude of efficiency versus rail, and and rail and rail is much more efficient than the highway. Uh, and so we have essentially, as a nation, we have a choice. Uh, I guess we can say uh, we are not going to use. We're not going to have agriculture in the local Midwest, and, and it's not going to be a viable except for local, local uh, consumption. And we will, uh, we may not have to import, but nobody's going to Im import from us, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and we're not going to feed the world. And then that's to leave it up to Brazil, Argentina and uh, the Ukraine and, and the other areas that are capable of, of, of supporting that kind of produce. I, that strikes me as a bad idea. And that, uh, that the better idea is to allow the upper Midwest of the United States to continue and retain its character as a breadbasket for the world to fight off global hunger and enormous uh, uh, losses of, of human life and suffering to, uh, uh, to uh, lack of food. <clears throat> the, uh, that decision, if you make that decision, you think about it in those terms and you think about how, what, what that implies. It implies a large port and, and supporting community at the, on the current footprint of New Orleans. So you cannot do it out of a, um, uh, a bistro in the in the in the, uh, in the French uh, in the French market, you know, uh, you can't do it out of uh, the Café du Monde while you sip your beignet, your Café au lait, and eat your beignet. Okay, you got to have a community there, and that's the only place. Uh, there is one other place it could be. You could, excuse me, you could dismantle because everyone knows that the 
Mississippi River wants to go down what's now the Atchafalaya. You, you do know that. And the, the, one of the, that the Congress of the United States has told the Mississippi River that it can't do that. <laughs> and the enforcer is the Corps of Engineers. And periodically, the, eventually the river will win, by the way. Just, I don't know why we think it otherwise. Nice. <laughs> but, 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 you know, maybe not in our lifetime, and that'll be fine. Maybe in yours, because it might not be so far. But uh, so Morgan City, Louisiana is another potential because that then once once the Mississippi overwhelms what's called the New River Control Structure, which it nearly did by the way in 1992. Uh, it was a little little fact. Uh, right now, 30 percent of the river by law is diverted into the Atchafalaya Basin. The other 70% goes down to the current base bed of the Mississippi and runs out to the Gulf of Mexico, supporting that navigation I described. Uh, it, uh, once the, the river goes down there, we'll have to do the same thing at Morgan City, but, uh, or we can at that point make a different decision and decide to reconvert the prairie back to to prairie and set it up as a, a you know buffalo at work and and I'm sure we'll do some tourism there you know it, it'll be a it'll be a different you know the, the communities will continue to thrive but they'll be different communities and the world will have to look elsewhere for 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 uh, for for uh, for its hunger. Uh, Mr. Bryant, you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, you know that Mississippi has been the deal. Um, they struck a balance where they allow a certain amount of water into the Atchafalaya and yet retain the water going down to New Orleans. And it kind of seemed parallel to the Botswana government giving water to uh, the Bushmen in the, in, the, in the sense that we've given people expectations on where they can live and how they can live. Um, I think of the uh, below sea level uh, communities in New Orleans. We've told them yes it's or yes we're providing um, places for you to live, water for you to drink. Um, whereas, whereas you might not actually want to be there in the future, uh, we're still providing that service. So, uh, and then New Orleans is tough because either way, it's hard to kick them out. It's hard to keep them there and, and have the next storm uh, do the same damage. But I just wanted to note uh, just a parallel of the government, um, not saying it's a bad thing, but the government making an expectation of where the water is going to go and how the water is going to be allocated, uh, whereas it might be. Where, whereas over time, it's not going to want to stay in the same course. Um, and that's the only thing I wanted to point out. Uh, Mr. Woodley talked about uh, the, the diverse uh, areas in, in Congress and in the administration that deal with water. So to me, that says there are two possible remedies. One, do we create a department of water with the secretary that's a member of the cabinet, which I personally am not inclined to. Or do we devolve some of those responsibilities back down to the state and the local level where uh, Mr. Workman seems to be doing great work? Um, but but my, my, my question is, how, how do you devolve some of those things that have traditionally been at the federal level back down to the, to the state or, or local level? Well, the water resources is very difficult, <coughs> uh, primarily because uh, if, you, if you look at a map, a river makes a wonderful political boundary, but it makes a very poor water resource development or engineering boundary. In other words, if I live on one side of a river, if there's a river in the community, and I live on one side of it, I know exactly who, where to go to vote, I know who my sheriff is, I know who my governor is, I know who my member of Congress is, I am not in doubt about that. Why? Because there's a river there, and I know which side I'm on. Perfect. But if I want to, let's say, dam that river or protect the community that straddles that river from flood, that river is a very poor boundary for decision making. If I try to put up a dam over half of it, that dam will not stand. It will not, nor will it be effective in holding back the water. And this, I make this point because it's not academic. Uh, prior to the flood of 1928, the Great Mississippi Flood of 1928, uh, Mississippi 
had had no need for a flood control. All, all these things were done at the state level. All levies and flood control and the, and the Mississippi, if you read the enabling statute for the Federal Mississippi River Commission in the 1870s, it was expressly forbidden. It was, it was to focus on navigation. It was expressly forbidden from investing in flood control except in aid of navigation, okay? Not a federal responsibility, state and local responsibility. What's it lead to, okay? Mississippi on the east bank and Arkansas on the west bank of the Mississippi River. Mississippi had no need for planning uh, or policy or cost-benefit analysis or any other uh, uh, sophisticated tool to determine its flood control policy. It had a simple flood control policy, but highly effective. Alabama plus two feet. <laughs> Did I say Alabama? I meant to say Arkansas. Uh, Alabama's on the other side. Uh, Arkansas plus two feet. Arkansas is on one side, Mississippi on the other. Arkansas plus two feet. If the river comes down, if they have two feet freeboard over on their levee, over Arkansas's levee, then the river will spill over Arkansas's levee before it reaches the top of Mississippi's levee. Mississippi will experience no flooding. Arkansas will go 10 feet up. Okay? Now, you look at that, and that's not, I'm not making this up. This is history, you did law. Okay? You look at that and say, do we need a federal policy? Uh, do we need a? Uh, do, I'm sorry. Do we need some agency that's capable of looking at both sides of the river? There are two agencies in the country, in the federal government, that are organized on watershed basis. If you look at the map of the Corps of Engineers and their districts, you're familiar with the federal regions, region one, two, three, four. We're in one here. I live in uh, three. Out of, that's headquartered in Philadelphia. This is Boston, region one. All your federal agencies, EPA, etc., based on that. Okay. Uh, two agencies don't follow that rule. Can you guess them? I mean, one's fairly obvious. I'm, I'm sitting here. Hello, <laughs> Army Corps of Engineers. What would the other one be? Do you think? Uh, it's a U.S. Coast Guard because you don't want to rescue just the people on one side of the river either. You want to rescue, you want to rescue both people regardless of which side of the river they live on. Those are the only two agencies organized by watershed and not by political boundary, and not by political boundary because the rivers are often the political boundaries. I think we've, we've worked you hard enough. Thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>